Well, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, actually, we can go straight to questions and answers. I'm just kidding. Um, and thank you very much for inviting me. I never dreamt in my life that I would stand in front of a Jewish crowd 2013 sharing my life story. Because obviously my life started out in a very, very different way. And even today, um, I struggle a little bit how to explain something that my son first asked me to explain to him. Because he asked me once, he was 14 years old, he's now 23, he asked me, Abba, Mia Sabashili, father, who is my grandfather? And that's where the story started, to give an answer, a true answer to your own son. And from that on, I gave answers to others who had questions. Because there were questions, and there are questions. How can it be that I am an Israeli citizen, I'm an American citizen now too, um, served in the Israeli Defense Forces, I was an officer, and on the other hand, my father, as you heard, was a highly decorated World War II tank commander and an ardent supporter of the Nazi system. The story in between is, of course, my life. And um, my life brought me where I am right now here. And how did it start? Well, it always starts with where were you born and what time you were born. And I was born in a beautiful city in Germany called Bamberg in 1958. Uh, anybody ever been in Germany? I hope you were there or you're planning to be there. Um, it's a beautiful city in the south of Germany, um, in, nestled between Würzburg and Nuremberg. One of those picture book cities that you see in tourist brochures old uh, churches, old buildings, a beautiful cathedral in the downtown area, uh, each hill crowned by a church, therefore Bamberg is called the Rome of the North, a very Catholic city, once was the center of the Holy Roman Empire in the 11th century. And in this city, city full of history, I grew up in with the sense of history. And we were taught as children to be aware about the history in that city. And so I learned everything from very early age on, as I remember in elementary school, about what queen and kings and bishops and noblemen and, uh, served and lived in the city. But one thing I noticed as a child very early on, that certain things the adults wouldn't talk about. And it had to do with the recent past. And the recent past was present, not because Bamberg was destroyed by the war. There were hardly any signs of a war in Bamberg. Bamberg was left untouched. American bombers did not bomb Bamberg because of the history of the town. But um, we as children knew that something happened because not because we talked about it, we taught about it, but we talked about it, we knew about a war. That what we knew, that there was a war called the Second World War. And the war was present because there were about 15,000 American soldiers and family members living in the outskirts of the city and American military police patrolled the, uh, the city in the nighttime, not because of the Germans, but because of drunken GIs. And um, we as children understood, and I understood, if there was a war and there were foreign soldiers, we didn't win that war, because in the war there were winners and losers. And so I asked my father, of course, the question, what happened in that war and what did you do in that war? What was your role out of curiosity? And initially my father was very reluctant to talk about it until he shared with me his life story on long walks that we had on Sunday afternoon in the forest. Uh, he was a hunter, an outdoor person. He taught me how to handle a rifle, how to shoot, how to fish. And we spent a lot of time together, quality time as father and son, and he shared with me the story that he was born into a family of warriors, as he said. My grand-grandfather fought as an officer in the Franco-Prussian War in 1870. My grandfather fought in the First World War as an officer in, in the in the, in the, against the French. And uh, my father, he told me he served as a tank commander under the command of the famous General Guderian, the father of the German Blitzkrieg, and served from the September the 1st, 1939, from the invasion of Poland until the bitter end, until April 1945, uh, under the command of General Guderian, and rose very quickly in the, to the ranks of a major, one of the youngest officers in the German army, in that rank, and uh, became a war hero for his accomplishment on the Eastern Front, where he participated, or actually liberated, as he said, or conquered, as we know it, a city on the, uh, on the way towards Moscow called Orel and was awarded the Knight's Cross by a man, as you heard, he adoringly referred to as his Führer. 
And so, of course, for, my, for me, my father was a hero. Naive thinking of a child, my father was a hero, reinforced by the message that his friends and his old comrades who came to our house at least once a year to celebrate the good old times at the old comrade meetings, and they reinforced that message that your father is a hero and you should look up to him. And so I did. On the other hand, my mother told me a completely different story, though. The war is catastrophe, the war is horror, the war is loss. Because she, was, she grew up in Czechoslovakia, was born in Czechoslovakia as an ethnic German. And uh, as a result of the war, everything she had to give up. Her parents owned a, a flourishing merchant business, a glove manufacturing business, and uh, had a beautiful villa in the outskirts of Karlsbad. And they had to flee from the advancing Soviet troops across the border towards Germany and lost everything. So on the one hand, the war is horror, the war is catastrophe. On the other hand, the war is glory. With this kind of picture is painted to my mind I grew up with. But I knew there was something else, something mysterious in that war that, again, the adults wouldn't talk about. And it had to do, actually, with a house, and a lot had to do with the house that we were living in. It was a massive two-story building in downtown Bamberg. And uh, the entire second floor, only one lady lived there. And I was not supposed to talk to her. My mother referred to her as the Countess, die Gräfin, and I was only should refer to her as the Gräfin, the Countess, and only speak to her when spoken to. And we rented an apartment in the first floor with another family, and right next to the wooden, massive wooden stairway that led upstairs to the second floor, there was a painting hanging on the wall. A painting of a man who looked like my father, whom I saw on pictures at home in uniform, a painting in this, this man in a uniform with the officer's insignia, the cross around his neck, the officer's hat. And he looked very similar to my father. So I asked my father, who is this man? And my father referred to him as the traitor, and I should not ask questions about him. And I was confused, because how can be a person who is a traitor, and traitor is a bad name, how can be a person who looks like my father be bad, and my father who looks like him, at least in the uniform and pictures that I saw, is good. Something is not right. Naive question of a child. Until later I learned that the man who my father referred to as a traitor was a portrait of Count Klaus von Stauffenberg, the German colonel who was leading the assassination attempt on Adolf Hitler on the 20th of July 1944, trying to rid Germany of the tyrant, and his widow Nina von Stauffenberg, die Gräfin, the countess, lived upstairs. And so under our roof, I was living literally in the shadow of two German heroes. On the one hand, my father, a self-declared or declared German war hero. On the other hand, a man who in post-war Germany was held to highest esteem as a post-war hero. Now, what happened? Something happened, and my father didn't want to talk about it. And in school, we talked about the Second World War. We talked about the rise of the Nazis to power. We talked about the Nazis uh, um, destroying the nascent German democracy called the Weimar Republic, and the Nazis triggered the Second World War, and as a result of the Second World War, 70, 80 million people died, among them, six million Jews, as collateral damage of war. And then the Nazis disappeared, poof. Kind of the Huns invaded Germany, and then they disappeared. That was kind of the tenor of the teaching that I received. And this whole mystery, of, around what happened was resolved and came to surface in the summer of 1972 with the Olympics in Munich in the August of 1972. Why the Olympics? Well, the Olympics were supposedly the event that should demonstrate to the world that Germany is now a new Germany, not the Germany of 1936 when Germany hosted the Olympics under Adolf Hitler, which was abused for propaganda purposes in Berlin. No, this was the new Germany, the democratic Germany, the Germany part of the Western Alliance, the Germany led by a chancellor, his name was Willy Brandt, who was elected in 1969, who himself was a victim of the Nazis. He was a social democrat who had to flee Germany in 1933 and return to Germany in 1945, rebuilding the, his party and then rose to power in 1969. And he was the first post-war German politician who, in public at least, demonstrated his pain and sorrow about the past. In December 1970, Willy Brandt traveled to Poland, and in front of the Warsaw Ghetto Memorial, he sank on his knees, bowed his head, and asked for forgiveness for what Germany did. 
And I remember that picture in the newspaper that my father slammed on the breakfast table. We read newspapers every morning, even together. Slammed it on the breakfast table, pointing with a finger on the picture of the chances depicting on kneeling in front of the memorial, screaming, yelling, Farat, wieder ein Verräter, treason, again a traitor. Because for my father there was nothing to forgive for. And I was confused. How can my father be so irate? This was a man kneeling in front of a memorial. I was a born raised as a Catholic. My mother was Catholic, my father Protestant though. And for me, I went to church, I was an altar boy. Kneeling in front of a memorial was a sign of devotion, a sign of humility. Why is my father so mad? And then came, ten days later, the catastrophe. The same team of Israelis so proudly paraded into the stadium in the summer of 1972 with the flag, the Israeli flag, right in, the, in their hand. The same team was brutally assaulted by a group of Palestinian terrorists. Two Israelis were killed immediately in the Olympic village. The remainder were taken hostage. The terrorists in the, were holding up the hostages in the Olympic village in the apartment. And the German government, so deeply embarrassed that it happened on German soil, dispatched highest ranking government officials among them, the Minister of Interior, who negotiated face to face with the terrorist leader and asked and begged him to release the Israeli hostages, offering himself and government members as hostages. And the terrorists refused. They demanded that Israel releases Arab prisoners from Israeli prisons and uh, demanded to be flown out to an Arab country of the choice where allegedly an exchange would take place between the Israeli hostages and the Arabs uh, prisoners. And the German government um, decided to fly them out at night with three helicopters to a military airport outside Munich called First and Fürbrook where then allegedly uh, uh, they would board a German military Boeing 707 to fly to an Arab country. That never happened. Um, when they landed the helicopters, the, is, the terrorists immediately realized that they were trapped. There were no pilots and no crew in the Boeing 707, and they opened fire. And the police, of course, opened fire too. And in the firefight, all the Israeli hostages were killed immediately. The terrorists threw a hand grenade in one of the helicopters, which exploded with all the hostages killed instantly. The other helicopters with the hostages tied and bound to the chairs and seats were sprayed with machine gun fire and they killed them. The next day in the newspaper, this picture that changed the course of my life. Two helicopters on the tarmac, one burned out with the charred remains of the Israelis inside, the other helicopter with the Israelis' bodies of the athletes slumped forward, covered with linen, and above a big headline, Jews killed in Germany again. And so I was confused. And what does it mean? So I asked my father, Father, what does it mean, Jews killed in Germany again? An innocent question that I asked. And my father, who normally answered all the questions and involved me in, in discussions about daily affairs, very intelligent, very intellectual, very educated man, his answer was, in our house, we don't talk about them. It's over with them. We're done with them. Don't ask questions about them. Then he meant the Jews. I was confused. Why not? And in school, we started to talk about the real implication of the murder of Israelis on German soil. What does it mean in the context of history? And our teachers, in the absence of a structured Holocaust curriculum, which did not yet exist at that time, started to tell us everything we needed to know, what they wanted to tell from their own perspective about that time. Some of them cried. I remember one of my history teachers cried openly and weeply in class, telling us about Auschwitz, Birkenau, Majdanek, the mass murder of Jews, the policy of the German government to kill all Jews, Wannsee Conference, Eichmann, Mengele, and I was shocked. All of us were shocked. Not only about the different aspect of history, which we didn't know at that point in time, but I asked myself the question, what did my father do, the war hero? Was he one of those murderers? I needed to know. He was my father. I loved him. I respected him. So I asked him and I came home. I said, Father, in the school we talk, started to talk about the Holocaust and our teachers told us, my father looked at me, your teachers talked about the Holocaust? It's all a lie. Your teachers are communists. Don't listen to them. They're just agitating you, trying to separate families like they do in the East, in East Germany. Being a communist was a big boogeyman at the time. He just lived about 40, 50 miles away from the East German border, the Iron Curtain, as it was called. So that was the big boogeyman. But I didn't believe that my teachers were bad. 
how can it be that they were telling me one story and my father tells me another one? There is something going on. Doubts I had. And so I started to read anything I could and I found in the, in the library about that time. And the more I read and the more I heard, the more answers I wanted to have. The answer, what did my father do? And so I started to ask him. And I asked him using the fact that my father was a raging alcoholic. And as a child of an alcoholic parent, I learned, I learned that when my father was too drunk, I couldn't talk to him. He was in La La Land. When he was not drunk yet, he couldn't talk to him because he was restless, irritated, discontent, trying to figure out where to get the next drink from. And when he was in the twilight zone, I nowadays coined the term shicker zone, um, he, I could approach him and I could manipulate him, I could find things out. And so I asked him and the answers came out in waves. Phase one, burned whatever allegedly happened, so he already, already admitted that something happened, um, we didn't do it. It was, we were the Wehrmacht, it was the SS, which was a blatant lie. The Wehrmacht was so deeply involved that Wehrmacht officers complained to their leaders and even to Adolf Hitler, and a general even did that in writing, that the murder of civilians is bad for morale. Of course it's bad for morale if you order soldiers to kill civilians. Stauffenberg's widow told me that ranking officers in the chief of staff office, including his, her husband, when they found out about the mass murder of Jews in the East, which was a state secret, some of them turned like her husband and joined the resistance. So they knew, everybody knew. My father lied to me. Second phase of answers. Well, whatever happened, Bernd, you have to understand, we were fighting partisans. So anybody who didn't wear a uniform was a civilian automatically qualified as a partisan, and partisans, the rules of law, uh, the rules of war didn't apply, and you could kill them. So rationalization of mass murder. I ask him just a rhetoric question. I said, Father, 1.2 million children, babies, infants, were thrown in into concentration camps, gassed on their arrival, the bodies burned and the ashes scattered. You tell me that this was a fight against the army? Something is not right. You're lying. And then came the, he probably reconsidered because then came the last phase of answers, the final phase, and I remember that evening when he came out with that. And he said, Bernd, you have to understand what had to happen. It had to happen. I said, what do you mean it had to happen? Well. Remember when you, when you were in the forest and I was teaching you how to hunt and that not, never to kill a healthy animal, only to kill the sick animal so the healthy animals can survive. This is the task of a hunter. This is the same thing in human life. We had to get rid of the riffraff, clean up all the unworthy life so that the worthy life, the Aryans, could survive. Lebensraum. And I said, what do you mean by that? I said, the Jews were the riffraff. We had to deal with them. He never used the term murder. He just meant to mention that we transported them to camps. The only mistakes that we made, he said, we used the train capacity to transport the Jews to the camps, which was, we didn't have then enough train capacity to supply the troops in the front. Therefore, we lost the war. Ergo, the Jews made us lose the war. Now, there was a kernel of truth with that, because Stauffenberg, in conversations with his widow, I, and it was also documented, he told her that he found out about the Holocaust, about Auschwitz, the fact that he was, a chief of, he was working in the chief of staff office for the logistical affairs, he was responsible for the tr supplying troops in the front, he never figured out why there was not enough train capacity to supply the troops in the front. And then the way he found out what happened with the train capacity. So the train capacity story was true, just from a different aspect. And that was enough for me. That just was the last thing that broke the camel's neck, the straw that broke the camel's neck. I didn't want to have anything to do with my father. This was not my father I could look up to. This was the father I looked down to. This was not the father who provided me with values. These were not values of life. These were life negating values. And I turned away from him. And I got desperate. And one of my teachers noticed that I was restless, irritable, and discontent from another aspect. And he asked me, he said, Bernd, what happened? You're a good student, but you're not, you're very unruly, something happened. Is, do you have problems at home? Is there anything wrong with your father? He said, I didn't want to talk about my father. And he sat me down one day and said, if you don't want to talk about your father, I talk about my father. He was a former Jesuit priest, a wonderful man. And he said, my father never returned from Stalingrad. He disappeared. He probably was killed or, or binded up in a, in a Soviet prisoner camp and died. And I grew up without a father. And as to fill the spiritual void, I, I, 
I became a priest, and as a priest then I became a teacher, and teaching young students like you to be better people. In order for you to overcome your shame and your guilt, as a Catholic, you have to make amends. And I said, how should I make amends? Make amends to those who were harmed. Make amends to Jews. I said, I don't know Jews. I never met a Jew in my life. I didn't know how a Jew looked like, except the, the victims that I saw, the pictures I saw in the newspaper after the Olympic massacre. And he said, well, I get you together with a group of young Jews. They actually come next month. There's a group of young Jews, Israelis, Jews and Arabs alike, who come to Germany invited by the German government and, and some church organizations to build peace among each other. Maybe you can join them. I make it sure that you can. And so, he, so I did. And when young people get together, so I joined this group with one of the few Germans, the last thing you do is try to find out what makes you feel different. You try to find out what makes you feel alike, what music you like, what food you like. I like the Israeli girls a lot. Uh, I leave it like that. And um, one of them, specifically in the few days we were together, we bonded and she said, uh, well, if you like me so much, why don't you visit me in Israel? Tacheles, Israeli girls are like that. And, uh, and I said, well, sure, I will visit you. When? I said, whenever you can. And so when she left a few days later, I was heartbroken. I was also wanted to find out more about them because they were like me. There was nothing that was separating us. We were, we were young people, human beings, not Jews and Germans, Jews and Christians, Israelis and Germans. We were young people. And so one month later or six weeks later, I uh, hitchhiked to Italy. I had no money. I uh, couldn't afford a plane ticket. I hitchhiked to Italy and uh, to, the Anco uh, to the port in Italy called Ancona it's in, the, in the northern Adriatic Sea. And from there I took a ferry, not a cruise ship, so don't repeat that, and shipped to the entire Mediterranean, letting her know by a telex that I would arrive in that date in Haifa. And she actually received me and, and waited for me at the harbor and overjoyed seeing me. She took me to her parents' apartment in Neve Shanan in Haifa. And her parents were these typical, hardworking Ashkenazi Jews who took me in immediately into, uh, into their apartment. Her father, a very burly, very muscular, um, Polish, Polish, Polish Jew, he took me in, spoke Yiddish with me, put his arm around me, took my rucksack off and said, you stay here and, and put food on the table and eat, you must be hungry. And they chatted with me in Yiddish and I had no idea what they were talking about. <laughs> um, and her daughter tried to translate and interpret and uh, then her father noticed that this is not a conversation. And he looked at me and said, in German, halting, but clear German, he said, if you want to speak German, we can speak German. I said, how did you learn that? He didn't say a word, just looked me in the eye and rolled up the sleeve on his, on his forearm and showed, to, showed me the number tattooed on his forearm and said, ich war in Lagern, I was in the camps. That's all what he had to say for me to wanting to disappear, sink in the ground for, out of shame because I was the first Holocaust survivor I ever met. And he looked at me and noticed my, my fear and he said, don't worry about it, you didn't do it. But you have to make me a promise that as long as you stay in my house that you try to understand what happened. And I want, you to, want to take you to a place where you really will understand it. And he took me to Yad Vashem, to the Holocaust Memorial in Yerushalayim. And they introduced me to the Shoah, the catastrophe, not the Holocaust. The Holocaust is a horrible word, by the way. It's translated Holocaustus, the burnt offering, as if what happened in Auschwitz, Majdanek, Treblinka was a religious ceremony, a sacrifice to a, to a whatever god. No, this was mass murder. Cold-blooded mass murder on a, on a scale never seen in history. And so then he introduced me to the Shoah, and I understood for the first time that six million was not an abstract, but it was one plus one plus one, one individual fate after the other, wiped out by people like my father, indirectly or directly. And I was deeply ashamed, but also I was very curious to understand why people who suffered so much could continue living as individuals, building families, building a country, having hope and a spirit to move forward, maintaining their faith. What makes them tick? What is so unique? What makes them Jewish? I wanted to understand. And when I returned to Germany, I decided that I wanted to learn more about Jews. And where could I learn from Jews? From Jews. And I said in my mind that I wanted to meet Jews. Where would you meet Jews in Germany? There were about 25, 28,000 left in a population of 60 million, very hard to locate. And hermetically sealed off their community centers in the large cities after the, Olympic, the events in the Olympics in 1972. So, lo and behold, I found a small Jewish community in my hometown, which I later learned was a community of survivors. 
about 30 people, and the chair of the Jewish community, his name was Itzhak Rosenberg, opened the door literally and figuratively to me, and um, I remember our first meeting, he looked at me, curious, was very curious why a German wants to learn about Jews. And uh, he himself was a Holocaust survivor. He showed me in the first meeting the number tattooed on his forearm and said, look, all the people here in the community, all the Arthur Cuckers, he referred to them, are Holocaust survivors. And I have to take care of them. I'm the Yosha Kila. And I didn't understand what he meant. And I said, how can I help? And he looked at me and said, if you want to learn something, we can make a geschäft. You can be my Shabbos goy and you help me take care of the Arthur Cuckers and in return I will teach you. That's what he said. No pun intended. I had no idea what he meant, but I knew that was a ticket into the community. So I came every Friday and Saturday, and I remember the first Friday I showed up at, at 6 o'clock in the evening to, to set up everything, and he looked at the watch and said, 6 o'clock sharp. Now I know that you're a German, uh, because you follow orders. And uh, he smiled. He was a very wicked humor. And um, week by week, Month by month, holiday by holiday, I served in this community as Shabbos Goy and grew into this community of choice, away from my, from my family of origin. And the closer I came in this community, the more I moved away emotionally from my family. And it came a point, I remember when um, uh, Christmas Eve fell on a Friday night and um, it was a big deal in our family. Christmas Eve, uh, I, the whole ceremony had to be played through, I had to go with had a festive dinner at home, symbolic food, lentil soup and fish, when, when my mother went to, 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 to the cathedral for Christmas uh, mass, and then coming home, having this the celebration, uh, the Christmas tree with, lit up with real candle, with my father, my father standing there with the dark suit that he always had on for the Christmas, and the knight's cross around his neck. For me, for me at that point in time, this was a symbol of terror, not a symbol of pride, singing festive Christmas hymns. And I was not there that evening. And all hell broke loose when I came home the next day. And the, my father confronted me, my mother crying, said, where were you? And I said, I was where I had to be. You were together with your Jews? I said, yes, I was. And I will be there every single time I have to, because I refuse to sit at the same table with somebody who have blood on his hands, pretending to celebrate the birth of Christ. It's hypocrisy. I will not sit there with you anymore. And he said only one thing, house, get out. Which I did, and he cut me off, and uh, cutting me off meaning kind guilt. <laughs> and kind guilt had a problem when I was in medical school in my final years, and uh, one of the members of the community noticed that, and he, and they supported me. I remember he gave me a hundred mark and uh, said, "Take, Nimis." And I didn't understand what, why he gave me a hundred mark. I went to to uh, to Itzak. Said Itzak, uh, Moshe gave me a hundred mark. I don't know what to do with that. He said, he gave you 100 mark, which was a lot of money. Did you ask for 200? Uh, I said, no. <laughs> I said, because you're going. You don't know, you don't know what to do. <laughs> and, and I didn't know how to answer. He said, now, come on, make a joke, sit down. He, he, gave you, he gave you 100 mark because you, he cannot show emotions. He's an Auschwitz survivor that I am. He couldn't rebuild his emotions. He, for him to show his appreciation is to give you money. So he wants to pre he appreciate, express his appreciation of what you're doing. And I became very close to him and very close to the community, closer than I was before. And when Moshe died, uh, Itzhak asked me to be part of the Hefe Kedisha. And I said, Itzhak, I can't do it. I'm not Jewish. I knew enough that this is not appropriate. I knew what that meant. And he said, well, for us, you're one of us. We had no rabbi, no chazan. We had a visiting chazan from a military base, no rabbi. Sit down, be with us, and be in the Hefe Kedisha. And after this moving ceremony of the funeral, preparing the body, burying the body, saying the Kaddish, I said, if I'm one of them, I want to be one of them. This is my family. And um, I said, Itzhak, I want to be a Jew. Itzhak looked at me and said, it's a bad idea. <laughs> uh, yeah, he showed me his number again and said, this is what you get, suffering. Don't be a Jew. Don't be a tzedek. You don't have to be a Jew. You can be righteous. I said, I want to be a Jew. I said, well, I send you to a rabbi who can talk you out of it. He's in Frankfurt. And he sent a letter to the rabbi in Frankfurt, and the rabbi in Frankfurt made an appointment with me. I met him for lunch in Frankfurt, very polite man. He sat me down and said, young man, I heard that you want to become a Jew. First of all, I don't convert Germans. So, but I will teach you in respect for my friend Itzhak, I will teach you whatever you need to know. But no conversion. And so for the next two years, it was already my sixth and seventh year, 
since the beginning of this process, he taught me whatever I needed to know. And every time I met him, I asked him, who well, knew when? I said, no, until the spring of 1986, when he relented and said, I will refer your case to the rabbinical court. There are four rabbis, each rabbi, I'm one of them. If they come vote in your favor, so be it. But until you get there, and there's no, def there's no guaranteed outcome, you have to undergo some some minor corrections. Um, one of them is a plastic surgery that doesn't involve the nose, and leave it up to you to figure out what that is. And it had to be done in a kosher way in a mohel in uh, Switzerland, and uh, an Orthodox, and then uh, a few months later in an Orthodox mikveh in France, in Metz, I remember. And from there, I was, my case was presented, I presented myself to the rabbinical court in October 1986, and underwent a formal halachic conversion, and changed from one side to the other. And I remember the question of one of the rabbis had when I, after quizzing me for an hour, said, young man, I'm still not convinced. Why a German wants to become a Jew? Is it guilt? It doesn't count. Is it conviction? Knowledge is not conviction. What is it? And I told him my story. And um, I then passed and became a Jew and I became a Teodat Kiul and I knew that this is, that's it. I have to leave. Now that I've reached that point, I have to move on. And uh, I applied for an immigrant visa to the Israeli embassy in uh, Germany and the Sochnut, the Jewish agency. And within two months, it was granted. And I said goodbye to Itzhak, who was sad, but knew that he couldn't do anything. And his, uh, during our last meeting, he said, Bernd, I don't know what life you will live, but I want to be assured, because I never will meet you again, probably. He was right. Um, that you will live a Jewish life. Just answer me one question. I'm not a big Jew myself. I could choose the way I live. My wife is not Jewish, but I live a happy life. But you chose Judaism, so you, you need to live according to everything. So tell me, do you honor your parents? I said, it's a, what is the point of the question? You know the answer, I don't. So then you can't be a Jew. He looked at me and I knew what, what he wanted me to do. He wanted me to go home and say goodbye, which I don't, didn't want to do. I said, if you're a Jew, go home. And so I did. I said goodbye to my parents, my mother at least, the day before I left. She was terribly distraught and my father refused to see me, yelled and screamed, should get the hell out of the house, which I did. And the next day I began, I left for Israel and began the talich, the, the process of klita, of immigration into a kibbutz, uh, learned how to pick bananas, and if anybody wants to know anything about bananas, I'm the expert. Um, <laughs> for six months, then learned Hebrew in the evening, um, after, then for a year in the Israeli hospital to get my license up to Israeli par, became a physician in Israel, immediately took Israeli citizenship, which meant I needed to, uh, needed to be drafted into the Israeli military, and was drafted, and six months in the military, I had to undergo the officer's course because I was a physician, and they'd hit me. Standing there in front of the Israeli flag, getting our, our wings, so to say, attached on the shoulder as a young, young, young lieutenant, I was thinking, oh my God, I'm standing here with all the Israelis and the Sabres who is wearing off and with all the family members. If they find out that I'm my father's son, that I'm a Nazi son, they kick me out of that club. I better don't talk about it. I was really terribly afraid that somebody would find out about my past. I was ashamed, still ashamed, and I didn't talk to anybody. Not to my wife, not to anybody, not to friends. I was burned, the Jew from Germany who made Anya, period. That's all what I wanted to share. When we left Israel in the summer of 1991 to continue my residency training in the United States, uh, the truth came out when my son asked me a question at the age of 14, so so long I was holding out, and I answered him. Because I knew if I lied now, I would poison the relationship. I have to tell them the truth, regardless of what the outcome is. And my son, like all my children going to Jewish schools, at least at that time, um, Jewish education until to, 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 to high school, they had a family history day in school. And my son, so still so taken, so enthralled by the story, and it was reported to me through his teacher, he raised his hand and said, and my grandfather was a famous Nazi. Now that's not good. <laughs> if you do that in a Jewish school, not good. And I got a call from the principal. I had to go stand to the office, which I didn't know why. And uh, sat down and said, what happened? What did my son do? Hey, your son, Dr. Wolschläger, your respected member of our community, tells us a verdrehte Geschichte that your father was a Nazi. What's wrong with him? Is it the divorce at home, the trouble, 
is there something we need psychological support? We can help you. <laughs> I said, no, it's the true story. It had to come out. I knew that's it. It's not my son. And I told him the story. He was, of course, confused. The rabbi in the room, no pun intended rabbis, got more and more agitated, put his arm around my shoulder. Yeshakuach, kolakavot. What a story. You have to share it. I said, I can't do that. You pulled it out of me, and I, I can't. No, it's good for the neshama. It's good for you. And he was right. The first time I shared the story in school was in 2004. The truth came out. And uh, the weight was lifted off my shoulders. And I asked myself what happened in my life. This life that I lived, the circle of life that I opened so many years ago, I never closed it. I never went back home. I have to close it for my own sake, for my children's sake, and to move forward. And um, I decided to go back home together with my son to visit my parents. At the only place I knew I could visit them, the cemetery. And I found and located their grave, uh, ironically or tellingly, two to three rows parallel to the wall that separates the Jewish cemetery from the Christian cemetery in Bamberg. Not unusual in old cities in Germany to find that. When you stand even today in front of my parents' grave, look towards that wall, it's ironic because you see the Jewish gravestones, the big, tall Jewish gravestones that assimilated German Jews built like temples on top of their graveside, proudly displaying their, their, their status, casting their shadow across that wall. And I told my son, look, this is the irony that my grandparents, that my, your grandparents, my parents, are buried here in the shadow of history. And they never stepped out of the shadow even in death. And that means something. It means that you have to face history as long as you live, because otherwise you are condemned to live in the shadow, willingly or unwillingly. Face history on history terms. Admit to your mistakes. Make the best out of life. Move forward, never to repeat those mistakes again to build a better world, to do that what I taught you to do as a Jew, as a father, as a Jew, tikkun olam, repairing the world to make it better, not to make it worse. Not to repeat the mistakes that your grandfather did. And as such, I move forward, and as such, I share this story, not because I felt compelled to tell my very intimate life story, but to feel, to tell that there are odds in life that you have to overcome. And they get against all odds, Change is possible in people of different faith and of different backgrounds. And it's specifically important today because I personally have the feeling that we are set to repeat mistakes in the past over and over again. That the courage to change is diminishing and the willingness to give in and to repeat the mistakes that we used to do things like we did in the past are there again. If it were, if it looked back in Cambodia, in the killing fields of Cambodia in 1974, or if you look into Rwanda and in Hutsis and Tutsis slaughtered 800,000 to a million people in Africa in the early 90s, or in Central Europe in 1994, 1995, the war in the Balkans were Serbs herding Muslims into concentration camps, starving and beating them to death. We like to free, fall back, it is my impression, into hate. And therefore we have to ask ourselves, where does hate come from? And I have learned that hate comes not, uh, falls not out of the sky. It's been born in us by using words of hate that left unchallenged lead to deeds. And if deeds left unchallenged, they lead to habits. Then it's okay to do bad things. And if these habits left unchallenged, character will form, that those who are doing it are being awarded in society. And if character is being awarded and forms, then social norms will develop. And these social norms then explains why entire societies, like in Germany, condone the murder. And it happens over and over again. So when you hear the lesson that I learned, and the reason that I speak, and with that words I want to conclude, is that when you hear the words of hatred, Raise your voices. Speak up. Because we know, we should know where it leads. And nobody is exempt from hate. No faith, no creed, no race. But we as Jews have the obligation to understand where the words of hatred lead and should stop it right there. I had a wonderful experience recently, just leave it that with a food for thought, in an effort, in my effort, in my personal effort to bridge those worlds of hatred that I take very personal. We're very involved in building bridges between peoples of different faith. 
I met a visited a good friend of mine who I know for more than 30 years in Israel called in Shfaram, an Arab village. He's a Christian Arab, his name is Elias. And Elias introduced me to something that I didn't know. I heard about it, but I didn't know. He said, you want to see something? I said, yeah. And he introduced me, showed me a little synagogue in downtown Shfaram, next to the church, next to the mosque. And it's empty. No more Jews left. They left with the establishment of the state of Israel prior to that move to, to Haifa. Before that, they left. They were living in an Arab village with Arabs. And in this synagogue was almost ready to just set it up. It was just the Habima left, the Aron HaKodesh, no more uh, Torah rolls, and maintained, and an Arab family has the key to that synagogue for generations. And I said, it's uh, Elias, why do they maintain that? And they said, why we shouldn't? We are all children of Abraham, and these were my neighbors. If they come back or their children come back, there's a place to pray. And that's the way, that's the courage that one man displays. That's the courage that is actually motivating me to do a similar, building bridges, understanding, not letting hatred seep into our lives, having the courage to speak up, which is far more difficult than hating. Hating is easy. I hate them. To do something about it is far more difficult to reach out proactively. And so I hope my words and my life uh, in some way instill some hope and motivates other people, not necessarily to take these radical steps like I did, but to change something, to have more courage to speak up, to move forward, to do what I try to do against all odds, against all odds, change is possible. Thank you very much. And of course, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them and nothing, no question is too personal, so I heard them all. Don't worry about that. If I, you don't hear yourself, I will repeat the question loud and uh, loudly and uh, so we can give you the answer. Yes, sir. Where did you meet your wife and where is she? In, uh, in Israel, uh, when I was working as a young physician in the hospital, typical nurse, doctor story. Uh, and. Um, we lived together in Israel, moved into the States, and she, we were divorced, but she still lives here and not far away. We have good friends, and we raised our children together. They're all adults now, young adults. I go over there and I come back here. Yes, sir. I know your process took many, many years, which uh, probably resulted in being a very analytical decision as to what to do. I'm sure you had some doubts uh, about should you or should you not. Was there a particular point that uh, you had an epiphany where you knew that this was the right <coughs> decision, or a, a revelation that being Jewish was an important thing for you to do? Well, let me answer the question as follows. Uh, it was not to fill the fish in my liking for that that I became a Jew, because I learned to make a Polish to fill the fish, and I believe me, I don't eat it anymore. That's, a, that's just a sidebar. Um, for me, I asked myself, what am I doing? Am I joining another religion in its rigidity and formality, in the liturgy, or do I join a way of life? And for me, it was very clear, I don't join another religion. And that Judaism is far more than religion. Judaism is a way of life and a permanent questioning. I remember shiurim that I had with the rabbi and the discussion that we had as a simple, even as a non-Jew, questioning wisdom, asking questions, getting res responses from the rabbi, where I said, this is a religion that demands constant asking, answering, questioning, and practicing it. This is more than that in a religion. It's a way of life, this is a philosophy, this is a lifestyle, this is a culture, and it will never stop learning from it. And it dawned on me that this is what we all should do. And um, I became enthralled. Um, I'm not religious. 
I'm not observant, if you use that term for religion, but I'm a f deep believer. And my most touching moments are, I think I shared it with one of your rabbis, was when I met Rabbi Lau, who of course you know was the chief rabbi of Israel and um, himself a Holocaust survivor. He gave this very, gave this very intimate on Wednesday evenings, I don't know if he's still doing it in Tel Aviv for a group of interested people, Talmud Shi'ur, and I participated in, in one and um, in two. And just to be, that there is no authority, an authoritarian relationship between those those who lead the faith and those who practice the faith. It's a give and take. It's in, among equals, which is not often the case in many other religions. And it attracted me, um, the faith among equals. And I think I will always, and even 20, more than 25 years later, I have the same feeling about Judaism like I had the first day. I have some questions, <laughs> a lot of questions, but I know there will be many answers, and many answers to debate. There was a question over here before I return to the other side. Yes, ma'am. It's a very good question if I came back, I mean I came back after so many years and did I make peace and did I forgive my father? I learned one thing. I had very negative feelings about my father. I remember when I moved from Germany to Israel, my father tried to communicate with me and sent me letters. They went to a PO box in Tel Aviv and I never opened them. I hated them. Uh, Twenty years later I opened them and I started to write down my thoughts for my children's sake. And I noticed that my father was a deeply flawed man, full of pain, anger, and he deeply loved me as his only son. But he couldn't understand that his son betrayed him. And that was not what it was about. And I forgave him at graveside by all means, I didn't have negative feelings. And I forgave him, and I don't know if he can ever forgive me, in whatever shape or form we will encounter each other, but at least I know I don't harbor any negative feelings. I consider him as somebody who had a very flawed character, did some horrible things in his life, thought he did the right thing, and I learned something from it. And I have to be thankful to him for what he do, did, did not do, that I was able to do, move forward. And I think in the end, when I look at that, and my son asked me this question recently, what would my father think about him and me? I think he would be proud, because I became something that he would never imagine I would be, and very similar to him. I remember when I was standing there as a young officer, and I was thinking, if you would see me, you're my grand grandfather was an, was an officer, my grandfather an officer, you were an officer, and I'm an officer, but on the other side. <laughs> The last question, yeah. Um, you said you went to um, uh, Yad Vashem. Have you ever visited Auschwitz or Gdańsk? If, if you have, can you tell us some of your feelings about that? Yes, unfortunately I had to. I um, was, uh, I was asked if I could be the physician for a group of young children or young students to go to Auschwitz on the March of the Living, which I did three years ago, two years ago, with my daughter. And um, it was very, even though we were prepared for it for a year and underwent all kinds of preparations, and I thought I knew everything about it, and I'm steeled, um, I was emotionally deeply touched, pained and horrified, because entering the gates of hell, as Rabbi Laut in his speech in Auschwitz that we had the privilege to hear said, this was the, the entrance to hell. This was Dante's inferno on, of, on earth, man, made by men, for, pe for men and women. Horrible, the horror. And still today, it, 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 the chills run down my spine just to imagine what happened there. These killing fields, these pits filled with ashes. And um, it um, deeply shocked me. I was in Majdanek, I was in Treblinka, I was in other concentration camps. And it still should serve as a memory that what people are able to do against other people, it's horrible. And we have to do everything in our but we can in our abilities to never again make it happen that never again will never happen again.
and this is, takes a lot of work because I'm afraid there are always people who want to make it happen again out of hate. So thank you very much and I'm open for any questions outside. <laughs>